who knows, I'm going to go incredibly quickly through a lot of this because I believe that through a lot of this because I believe that a lot of the things that I'm talking about are things you know well. Hopefully I'm going to hit on some things that I'm considering from a different direction. Um, we're just, I'm bouncing back here. Silicon Valley Robotics was formed in 2010 by, pardon the bouncing, by a collection of 40 plus robotics groups. And we are now, um, when I mapped who was in the valley, we were approximately, oh, okay, look, we'll just stick with this. I had a meeting earlier and they needed me to do a trial of recording a presentation. And so I used the first three slides and now it's automatically timing. So let's just say in 2010, I mapped the landscape for Silicon Valley Robotics and I found 60 robotics companies. They had received a total of 120 million in venture funding. And in fact, the entire global robotics industry was on average each year getting about 120 million in venture funding, which is a tiny little drop in the bucket of venture funding. The Silicon Valley region had 18.7% of all global funding, which just gives you some idea of how little was happening. And our region was less than 5% of global robotics revenue. By 2020, I count 600 companies in the Silicon Valley region. Uh, my estimate is quite conservative. Um, I have to play nicely with other robotics associations, and I love that we've formed an international alliance of robotics associations, but there is always a little bit of an element of how large are you? How many members do you have? How many companies in your region? So I keep my estimation as conservative as I think I can back up with company names and lists, we are still three times larger than any other robotics center cluster in the world. Beijing is perhaps the area that is most approaching rapidly. Boston would be the area behind that. If we're interested in understanding where robotics innovation is happening globally, and the word innovation is critical, Silicon Valley Robotics was formed to support innovation and commercialization. So not research, nor existing commercial companies explicitly, but really the transition to taking something innovative and commercializing it. So back to 2010 to 2020, 10x growth in the number of companies in the Bay, perhaps 20x really, because companies are coming and going very rapidly. There has been a 55x growth in the amount of venture funding going into companies in the Bay Area. My estimates for 2020 was 6.5 billion. In total, since 2010, 30 billion. And it's one of those hockey stick curves because there was very little investment until about 2013. And as it's grown, it's grown exponentially. We are twice as much of the global proportion of funding as we were because on average, there's about 40% of global funding is coming in. It can occasionally, some years it can be 50%, some years it can be 33%. Generally speaking, 40% of all global investment into robotics is going into companies in the Bay Area. And we're still less than 5% of global revenue. Global revenue is about 48 billion. So what I'm getting at here is starting to establish what I talk about when I talk about the robotics industry. And when I talk about the robotics industry, um, I'm not always talking about the same industry that other people talk about. And so I'm going to try and really clarify what the robotics industry means to Silicon Valley Robotics. And as I pointed out, the Silicon Valley Robotics cluster has billions of companies worth billions of dollars, but not making billions of dollars yet. And that's perhaps one of the differences. This is a venture fund analysis of the robotics landscape. And uh, when they looked at 2021 year to date, this came out in late January, they estimate 2000 robotics and AI companies in the Bay Area, 650 in Boston, 250 in Pittsburgh. And these are the three largest global areas uh, they do an analysis of the other regions of the US as well. But I think we all know that once we start 
talking about Pittsburgh, then Austin, Seattle, Los Angeles is actually larger, uh, about the same size as Boston, but Los Angeles is also greatly understated. New York, uh, Washington area, there are at least 10 clusters of robotics, Denver, Florida, in the US, often associated with national laboratory areas or large um, army or navy bases. Now, I like to point out that robotics in Silicon Valley is the small fish in the large pond. And that's why we don't have a reputation for robotics. If we look at the sum total of the economics of the robotics industry, the entire industry, then 2019 figures is it's still under $100 billion. Whereas we have some tech companies where we're talking trillions of dollars in terms of total tech company revenue. And the breakdown of the economics of robotics is that approximately 48 billion is direct and indirect revenue from the robotics industry. 29 billion is investment, and that was in the 2019 year, and 17 billion was acquisition. And where the money goes speaks a lot to what you call the robotics industry. Now, I recommend that you look at the Silicon Valley Bank report on robotic that came out at the end of last year. They now have a department that looks at robotics because there is a sufficient number of new companies through the venture investing in this for it to be a major part of their global economics landscape. And you can see where robotics fits into the landscape between cloud, Internet of Things, augmented reality, cybersecurity, data analytics, simulation, integration, additive manufacturing. When I talk to government, they tend to see robotics as being something that is advanced manufacturing and additive manufacturing, or something that is drones, or they don't see it at all, even though it is part of agriculture, it's part of construction, it's part of medical. Um, I look at robotics across as an enabling technology across multiple industries. But that's because this is what I would call robotics 2.0 thinking rather than robotics 1.0 thinking. I've talked already about the hockey stick growth in investment. If you think it's stalled, it hasn't actually stalled. What we're seeing in 2019 was an important point where the dollar amounts went up the number of deals went down. So what we're seeing is more billion dollar companies, more consolidation of industry in certain sectors. So the establishment of category leaders. Whereas when we look at the 2015 um, figures for robotics, it's really more exploratory. There are a lot of people taking bets on robotics in this industry and robotics in that industry. Once we're starting to get series C, series D funding and acquisitions, then robotics is becoming an established player. And I will say that the 2021 uh, sum total of venture funding in the Silicon Valley region for robotics was 3 billion. So there isn't an actual drop. That's a pretty big figure for the first quarter of 21. Now, I'm gonna skip over the, the slides where I'm talking about productivity and automation. And I, sometimes give presentations that is just a fantastic slideshow of amazing robotics companies across all of these different areas. And I never run out. I keep adding, going, oh, I left out robotics in X, Y, or Z vertical. One of the things that we do have to address is uh, automation, displacement of employment. But I will add that McKinsey finds that the people who were displaced through COVID are a very strong overlap between people that were at risk of displacement from automation in longer term. So this is another incident where the pandemic has escalated robotics for a 10 year stretch. So I've heard through the Retail Analytics Council of America, through the um, data on medical robotics, that we are 10 years further down the roadmap of adoption we've gone past the let's kick the tires stage in 
70 to 90 percent of business owners in these areas. And they're like, no, we know we want robotics and automation and we want it now rather than what was predicted to be a 10 year period. So this means that also in terms of displacement, we've just had a 10 year kind of consolidation in one year. But I will point out one of the biggest problems with figures about robots and jobs is that they misidentify the correlation between jobs that humans do and tasks that robots can do. Um, The most widely cited report about that that came out said that there was a 99% probability that fashion models would be replaced by robots based on the way they analysed the data, on the labour skills analysis from the Department of Labour Statistics. So that's clearly not correct. And we see this in this McKinsey report where they are predicting where remote work, and this is the potential for teleoperation and then automation, is going to have the next impacts. And here's the rest of the chart we will see that they just don't even see equipment, materials, machinery, handling and moving objects, controlling machines and mechanical equipment as being on the radar. Whereas I see these being breakout industries that have investment, but do not yet have revenue. Ditto measuring products or surroundings, for example, estimating building costs or uh, doing geological surveys, you know, on mining tailings and all of these things are uh, also assistance in emergencies. So, uh, oh, patrol properties to maintain safety. Well, I think we're all aware of how many robotics security companies have emerged recently. Cobalt and Nightscope are perhaps the two largest, but they are definitely not the only ones. We're starting to talk about category leaders emerging, not just entering the category. And As I pointed out, when you analyze business executives across many sectors and supply chain is a very good one to use as an understanding of where robotics is going because supply chain affects many, many industries. So if supply chain is adopting robotics and automation, it's going to be easier for robotics and automation to then enter into whichever the vertical is that we're talking about, whether it's agriculture, construction, or or health and medicine, um, or retail. And there is an incredibly strong desire to convert supply chain to robotics and automation. So this is how I try to explain why Silicon Valley robotics is different and has a different focus to established robotics industry associations. And in fact, the International Federation of Robotics, the IFR, I love what they do, but they fundamentally deal with robotics 1.0, whereas we're entering, since 2010, we've been entering the robotics 2.0 era. And I'll predict that robotics 3.0 is maybe 2060. And what do I mean by robotics 1.0? It's the robots that are also dull, dirty, dangerous, and dumb, not just doing dull, dirty, dangerous, and dumb jobs. They're usually caged in factories or far underground or out at sea or in space or in places where people aren't. And so most people don't really know that that robotics industry has existed since the 60s. And it is what is usually referred to when you hear any statistics about the robotics industry. In fact, These are largely called industrial robots, barring for the two on the right, which are engaged in logistics. And so they're called service robots. But the bulk of industry robots, the bulk of what I call robotics 1.0 are industrial robots. And 50% of them all have been building automobiles. Now, this is where you get $48 billion of revenue in 2019, which is $16.2 billion direct revenue and the rest is the software, the peripherals, the systems integration. And as I pointed out, this is not counting the self-driving car industry. This is counting the robots that build the cars. And so there is a fundamental definition of robotics industry that has been adopted because 50 years you need standards, you need international bodies, you need, you're collecting data and statistics. 
but it is fundamentally about welding automobile bodies with a little bit of service robots tacked on. Whereas the robotics that Silicon Valley is seeing are robots for every other job. And as far as the IFR collects data, or this is called other and unspecified, and it's increasing by multiples of, well, actually 50% is probably the wrong figure. It is continuing to grow enormously. And it's very, very difficult for statistics collecting bodies to understand how rapidly it's growing because of lack of revenue and a lack of awareness of where the revenue is potentially being made as well. And if people say, hey, isn't that more of a robotics 3.0 kind of a robot there because it's a, a planetary rover, I think a key part there is it's a private company developing planetary rovers. So there's a heck of a lot of investment and growth happening everywhere from space through to social robotics that is not grant funded. And so to understand Robotics 2.0, you track the investment data rather than the revenue data. And I will use my metric for Robotics 3.0, which is predicting the future, is that we'll look at where the grant funding goes. So another way to break that down is to say that since 1960, we've had stationary robots. Today, we have mobile robots and robots that can do single tasks. And in the future, we will start to look at multitasking. And it's been referred to, Dr. Gil Pratt referred to this as a Cambrian explosion in robotics. I call it the four S's of Robotics 2.0 to go with the four D's of Robotics 1.0. And the fundamental differences here are that the robots are smarter and they have sensors all over them. And because they're smarter, they're capable of processing the sensor data in real time. That allows them to navigate. Navigation is the key technical or technological difference. And this is navigation, whether it's a fixed robot arm navigating within its environment or whether it's a mobile robot, a self-driving vehicle or some form of retail inventory or logistics robot. It's able to navigate more intelligently, which makes it safer. I would still argue that they are not multitasking robots. They're capable of doing a single simple task. And here's just an example of how far down benchline robotics that other people are building off are $2,000 for an autonomous capable robot base. Like it has all the sensors to do autonomous navigation out of the box for $2,000. $6,000 for an industrial precision robot arm, excluding the end effector, but this was the price from um, Automata from the UK. Haddington Dynamics was pricing their robot arm with end effector at $7,500, but Ocado's acquired them. And companies like Sake Robotics are producing a 3D printed robot gripper for $2,500. And they're now doing... Um, warehouse automation, as well as providing these grippers for many use cases. So you can put together a full robot for $10,000. And we're seeing the emergence of people who are not identifying as roboticists or in the robotics industry. They're in other industries buying off the shelf robot components to build their own robots. It's going to be really difficult to track where those robots are being used and what they're being used for. One of the fundamental drivers of this, and perhaps one of the ways of finding where these robots are being deployed is ROS, which is the Linux for robots. And if you look at the difference in deployment numbers after the release in 2010 to the release in 2018, you can see how powerful the impact of ROS has been. What I found anecdotally is that when I talk to new robotic companies, they all say that they've used ROS in their development. That's pretty significant. We're also training the next generation of robot operators so that robot operation is going to be very, very, potentially very simple. And the number of jobs that are going to be working with robots are going to incorporate jobs that we would call blue collar or unskilled. There are a lot of robot companies that just need people to throw boxes at the robots or go and pick them up from wherever they've fallen down. That kind of robot wrangling or remote teleoperation of robots are big growth 
sectors. Now, I did mention Robotics 3.0. You can track it by research grants, and there's a lot happening in single tasks becoming systems, in social robotics, and I would call that, let's forget that prediction, I've got the three M's of Robotics 4.0. This is a bit of a stretch, but it's a multitasking robot. It's an emotive robot capable of perhaps detecting our emotions in context more sensibly and certainly of being able to behave in a way that can be appropriate in a social situation. So it can appropriately utilise emotional expression. We also have the ability of robots to morph, to change shape. Soft robotics is going to play a very interesting role moving forward. Big Hero 6 is the best robot documentary out there, which was designed after consultation with SRI International and other lab, the people that were building micro robot factories and soft robots. And that uh, multi-agent system is based on the um, SRI micro factory work which is still very, very early days, but you can see the micro factories in action there. And you can see a little bit of the soft robotics research that's happening and Alice Nakamura's charm lab. And these are fantastic. Most ordinary people get very confused because these are the videos like Boston Dynamics that are very popular on the internet. And they give a very false expectation of where robotics is at commercially. I'm trying to race through this. so. These are very messy slides. I was trying to clean them up and I haven't quite got there. I'm refining this position, but Robotics 1.0 has determined 50% automotive welding, fixed robot arms, $48 billion of revenue in total with approximately an 11% increase each year. Good growth, but a linear progression. When you come from that industry, then you define industrial robots. And then over there, there's service robots, which is robots that aren't in factories. That's kind of the definition of it. And then there's personal robots in the home. And if you look at the IFR assessment of the size of these industries, then I put them together as these pie charts because the comparative size of these industries is in terms of the way that the industry is assessed by the existing industry is fundamentally flawed. And this is the growth from 2010 to 2020. You can see service and home have grown a lot, as has the factor of unknown. But if I look at the industry, what I see when looking at funding is this huge pie chart that covers all of these areas in and around what is known in with regard to revenue. And that's really terra nullius as far as the Robotics 1.0 industry is concerned. And Robotics 2.0 is approximately 150 billion in value projecting the 20, yeah, I have to double check that. If we were to add all of the revenue together from 2020 with the investment and the mergers and acquisitions, then we've gone from then that gives you the 150 billion that I put in one of the earlier slides. Now, what I'm trying to say is that the robotics industry really is only caring about the revenue factors. What I'm looking at usually is the investment factors. And this is what the other industries care about. So we have this separation. What the robotics industry, as established, cares about is happening in its own field. All the other industries, the Retail Analytics Council, the advanced manufacturing groups, the um, Oh, everybody involved in drones, in logistics, in healthcare, in every other field is interested in these emerging innovations. And that's one of the biggest gaps in terms of getting data about what is robotics and where is robotics. So robotics 2.0, this is my this was what I'd intended this presentation to be all about, and it was going to be diving into what's happened in the last five years in service robotics industry, in retail, in logistics. But it's hard to get, it's a largely qualitative feedback is the point that I wanted to get to. What I can bring together from that qualitative feedback is that we 
need to have quality. And it is very closely tied to all understandings of product quality. Although I found it hard to find correct definitions for product quality, but robots have become a product. And as such, they are expected to meet product standards. They are expected to be safe, reliable, durable, affordable, um, be accessible for most users or customers, fit for their purpose, and good feedback from customer and staff, particularly staff. Now, the most difficult thing for robotic startups is dealing with the initial market entry because you're generally speaking, a robotics company is looking at the potential to add value. And that is not how success happens in moving into these industries. Unless you're getting funded by an R&D group, the innovation wing of a large company. And that is a bad indicator for your success as a company because they are funded to kick the tires and to learn what's happening. They are not, even if they invest two years in your company, examples could be um, Lowe's Hardware Innovation Laboratory and their investment into fellow robots. Uh, all of the major players have innovation labs. Being in their innovation lab does not translate into being deployed in their shop front. To be deployed in the shop front, you're coming out of their operational budget, not their innovation R&D budget. And pretty much the only way that you get in to the real operations is to reduce the cost. Right from the start, you must reduce cost. Then once you've done your first pilots in operational settings, even if you are there with your robot 24-7, making sure it works properly and tweaking the features and so forth, then your successful rollout is going to depend on that being incredibly reliable, that knowledge being transferable, you being compatible to whatever systems that they have there and easy to use. Then if you're increasing revenue, you're likely to stay then you can start the conversation about your potential to add value once you've achieved initial success in your beachhead market. And your ongoing success relates to both the additional value propositions and then you'll have adjacent opportunities. You can become the standard at that point. So this is how we try to provide informational bridges between, say, a robotics company that is developing a robot that will be utilized in um, packaging for pharmaceutical companies. It's going to allow um, maybe a new process, but it's going to get adopted first because it's going to reduce the cost of the existing process. Then it's going to allow personalizable medicine. You are not coming in the front door because you're allowing personalizable medicine. You're coming in the front door getting on the balance sheet, <clears throat> you're only on the balance sheet because you're reducing cost. And this is really critical for robotics to learn. And that's going to have an impact on what are the important metrics. If we're looking at what are the metrics from the perspective of the robotics industry, the new robotics 2.0 industry, skipping this standards landscape um, in 1994, there was basically one standard. In 2012, that standard had changed to really incorporate mobile robots to an extent. Now ISO TC 299 contains 30 standards for robots and we have ontological or definitional standards appearing. These revolve in five years um, review process. The point that I talked about right at the start is the gap between, a gap that I think is problematic and that is the US definition of AI actually now, as of 2019, incorporates, well, in 2019, there was no governmental definition of AI, I believe there is now, but we can see the defense thinking was that robotics was a part of AI. NIST had an RFI regarding the national proposed national AI strategy in May of 2019. 
when I read the document, and I was too late to officially contribute, but there were more than 50 contributors to this. Not a single company was robotics related, or when they were a large company like Amazon or Google or Microsoft, where we know that they have robotics groups, the whole text of their contribution was software. There was not a single contribution to, to this report which included robotics, that was robotics related. So I am very aware that we have a gap and we are not treating robotics as a um, field with unique challenges and opportunities. I did mention that I think that AIS <coughs> is perhaps a more appropriate description for the field because robotics and AI tends to be separated. One's hardware, one's software, fundamentally different, whereas really they are hand in hand together. Uh, many of you have been part of the IEEE EAD process, and that has split into multiple new standards work groups. I have lost touch of an understanding of the frameworks that are being addressed. Uh, so as I mentioned before, I'm a member of Oceanus as well, where we're looking at the ethical standards for AIS and the evolution there. I'll just get to Oceanus in a second. OECD has now released their AI policy observatory, but already what we can see here is a focus on AI because this is where the burning problem is. So they've released a framework that they're going to be doing consultation on this year. And their framework is fundamentally uh, the AI system model that you see there, data in and task output out and an AI model. So the whole part of the framework is understand the context, understand the data and input, understand the AI model, and understand the task and the output. This is very, very not connected to what I would believe are priorities in understanding the rollout of a physical system that's incorporating AI, although it is still good to see that advancing. This is... Um, just a snapshot of the Oceanus website, and you can see it's an open community for ethics in autonomous and intelligent systems. And the first act of Oceanus from two to three years ago was to develop a standards repository, a global standards repository. And it is a coordinating group of global standards organizations, but also other organizations that are concerned about the development of policies and standards and principles for the ethics of AIS. So I encourage you to join join me there. And I believe what the industry really needs is preemptive guidelines, which I believe the most similar applicable guidelines would be the autonomous driving levels. And I'm sorry that that doesn't produce at high resolution level, but you can see these are generally understood in the quite simple format, level one, level two, level three. We can condense it to a picture with a very short summary and give people an understanding of what level of autonomy is being discussed. In reality, um, it can get a lot more detailed. This is more from um, Standards International Organization. And we can start to talk specifically about regarding braking and acceleration regarding lane centering, regarding these quite explicit terms and conditions within these standard levels. But I do think that this preemptive level framework is a very interesting way to look at HRI. So I'll just come back to, I guess, the meat and potatoes of the presentation is, I think that we could do with levels of interactivity that could be understood in the same way that we go from zero, which is none, to level five, which might be full autonomous interactivity, and to look at the levels within that. So, for example, level one could relate to robots that operate within cages, within very fixed environments, really robotics 1.0 industry. Uh, a parallel that's not the robot arm is the AGV, which is the mobile robot that runs on tracks. You can detect obstacles in the pathway, but basically it stops, starts, it has a set pathway. It doesn't reconfigure. 
And that is the best way to meet safety standards. Then you could look at level two, where you have to factor in local condition guidelines and regulations. And any deviations of behavior are scripted and predictable. And any teleoperation, and you know, teleoperation is also kind of standing in for control there, but any control is obvious and visible. And then level three is where we're unleashing predictive behaviors and communication might happen without direct supervision, but would be available to be reviewed. And teleoperation might happen, but be, be subtly visible all the way up to uh, potential autonomous actions, invisible teleoperation, but controlled communication. And I think communication is perhaps the, um, the last autonomous bastion in that development to a place of full autonomy, which would start to be talking about potential agencies as well. But let's just, agency is a whole nother kettle of fish. I think it will be handy to start to look at a framework like this and then say, well, this section is understood. The safety standards exist. The um, We know how to interpret them in each country. To saying, okay, well, what do we need to provide to allow this operation? And at the moment, there isn't, without getting into extensive specificity for individual robots or individual robot companies. And robot companies are not going to be inclined to be um, adding excessive governance, but they are inclined to leverage a best practice if that allows them to penetrate a new market area. An example would be that, uh, for example, delivery robots have gone through a number of different trials in different regions. Some regions have banned them. Some regions have welcomed them. Some regions have developed a code. So we will only permit X number of robot density under X conditions and Y. So that can be used as a best practice. When you enter a new region, you can say, look, I know that you've never had robots here before, but did you know that San Francisco has had them for five years and they have developed this set of guidelines? And so I think we can do a lot of work around the level two area. And I think level three would be very much in the area of under research and ideally under control, but we're letting a lot of the genies out of the bottle right now. And I think this is where a lot of the ethical issues will be coming up. And I'm going to, sorry, put my email on the final slide because that was the end of the presentation. And I did want to leave five minutes for questions, but I'm very welcome questions on this, you know, at any time. I'm quite fascinated by where this is going to go and how, as an industry association, we can get ahead of the problems and help create a better pathway for robot adoption across these multiple industries that robotics is entering into. Thank you, Andrew. That's a wonderful presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor to questions. So while we're waiting on other people to ask questions, how about myself? Because it's my right. Um, so again, thank you so very much. Um, one of the biggest things we've been seeing in terms of adoption of robotics and basically people willing to kind of take that leap into robotics is this perceived trust uh, that we have in the technology that is going to meet our needs, that is going to do exactly what we want it to do. Uh, back in the like 1990s, we saw this big push for uh, advancements in machine vision, machine learning, 
and expert systems, especially within the realms of robotics, only to kind of have that come back and burn us. Uh, because there are a lot of promises and not a lot of deliveries. And I'm, I'm wondering whether or not there's certain things that we can be doing as a robotics community, especially the HRI community, to kind of give people better, um, I guess, again, trust in the systems yeah. that they're going to do what they are going to do, that they're going to be useful, that they're going to be uh, able to be leveraged um, by expert users, non-expert users uh, in the industries, especially in emerging application domains. I give other presentations on the ethics and the issues of robotics and AI, and I refer to the EPSA principles of robotics, although I've tweaked them a little bit, but I believe in five principles there, they've summarized most of these issues that I was talking about from a product perspective. Trust is certainly one of them. Transparency is another one. And manipulation of behavior is mm. another one. And identifiability. Now, I've taken that a little bit further, and I have five recommendations that I would put forward. Firstly, and I think this we should be doing, and I tell robotics companies to do this, it's amazing, it's a blind spot, is put identification on your robots. It is a fundamental trust builder. Um, and don't just put your branding on them because it's a branding opportunity too, but put identification. Allow people to be able to say it was robot X, Y, Z. And every other physical uh, motor vehicle, boat vehicle, aerial vehicle is required to have registration. So we're going to soon be required. Why don't we get in ahead of this and proactively adopt something like the open mobility data standards and say that then would allow us to control a registry of robots and to map that with not just the understanding of who is responsible for a robot, like who is legally responsible for that robot, wherever it is, but to perhaps match that up with things like the um, model cards, the AI model cards or developments around uh, explainability, which mm. generally speaking is going to be a little bit hard. So that's two of my fundamental recommendations. The next ones are that we uh, facilitate tech councils in local areas because I really think the, the, the big issue isn't how you pitch something overall to Target or Walmart, it's how it rolls out in this Walmart in this location. And one problem kills your entire rollout. That's how responsive retailers are to anything that breaks trust. And um, so, for example, Bossa Nova is no longer being deployed, not because there was a problem, but because at a time of pandemic, the fact that staff saw a robot when people were losing jobs was just no good. That was, so they're not going there. They're just not going to, to, to do that. Brand trust is fundamental for anybody who's customer facing. Uh, so EPSERC five principles. Um, the next thing is to develop robot ombuds people, because I think that we do not give people a voice and where the problems emerge, um, we need to be able to capture that and to provide that uh, to inform policy. And I was going to say, finally, uh, Silicon Valley Robotics has started an awards process for good robots. So we can um, effectively showcase what's good behavior rather than having people point out bad behavior. We're already starting to see people collect and point out bad behavior. So we need to be ready to say, this is what a good robot can and should do. And uh, transparency and expectation meeting, which is the fundamental aspect of this. Everybody in HRI, I think, is very aware of that need to set expectations. Uh, sorry, Ross, your question? Or? We could take it offline for a second time. Yes, I, it's now break time. Um, I'm happy to to put answers into the chat as well. Oh, and we can talk offline. And I really do hope everybody would reach out to me with any questions and feedback because I think that you're paying attention to the things that I would like to know more about as well because what I feel is that there's terra nullius area 
where developments are happening. And the people who are making policy are kind of going, so where are we supposed to be looking for guidance here? I'm not seeing it. Uh, and thank you. <laughs> thank you again, Andrea. So I don't know if anybody has been paying attention in the chat. Um, um, we are having some technical issues with this particular Google Meet, uh, so we actually have to switch to a different Meet. Yep, there you go. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I'll also bring this up here. Um, and so after the break, uh, we'll be coming up on the new uh, Meet link. Uh, I'm actually going to keep this one active uh, such that people can uh, follow the new link uh, if they are uh, joining us late. And in the meantime, I hope to see everybody in about 12 minutes time. And uh, if you have any questions for uh, Andra, if she uh, doesn't mind sticking around during the break, uh, we can also accommodate that as well. Thank you, everybody. That's a very good question. Um, Andrew, do you see the question in the chat? Uh, yes, and um, it's a myth that investors aren't interested in robotics. Uh, as pointed out, there's been $3 billion invested into robotics companies in the Silicon Valley region since Christmas. So, mm -hmm. you know, robotics is on, on all of the major investors' targets. Now, it doesn't mean that all investors are robotics investors, a lot of them have their sweet spot and it isn't always hardware. One of our problems is that there are a lot of follow on investors that are not robotics experts investing in robotics and you don't get any benefit in terms of them. Yes, there's money, but they don't necessarily have the experience or the wisdom. And, you know, so this most investors fail, frankly, at their investments don't succeed. So investors are a poor measure. They're definitely interested in robotics, but they don't always pick the right companies. Although there is a little bit of a, the more money a company gets, the more likely it is to succeed. Um, we saw a bit of a bubble in the drone industry before DGI kind of killed it. And DGI killed the drone industry for a period. They popped the bubble because everybody was investing in new hardwares, whereas DGI scaled their production and was able to undercut the with price and with features, everybody else. So what you saw was uh, the, the emergence of a category leader. And if you look at the Silicon Valley Bank analysis of investment into robotics um, from late 2020, and it's on the Silicon Valley Robotics website, they will point out that where you see the money going up, but the potential number of companies decreasing, it means that we're seeing the emergence of category leaders like the DGI that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's pushing smaller companies out. So we're starting to see that happen in areas of logistics. So Gray Orange um, just got a massive amount of investment money. A couple of them are IPOing via SPAC. So um, we had a bit of a billion dollar trend in self-driving vehicles. Now we're getting a bit of a billion dollar company trend in logistics robots. The e-commerce drive has pushed. As I mentioned earlier, supply chain, like robotics, has an impact on all of the industries downstream of supply chain. So supply chain is absolutely going for robotics and automation. Um, the breakdown of venture investments, companies' pre-revenue, okay, approximately 30% of investment in the Silicon Valley region is seed. Yes, I've got the global statistics. It's approximately 30% globally, maybe a little bit more, actually, probably more like 40% of 
globally is going into seed. And we're seeing the same emergence of category leader structure happening if we look at the global investment in robotics, where the rest of the world is five years behind it's where Silicon Valley is at. So Silicon Valley is investing more money into its robotics companies and growing them faster. The rest of the world is doing more seed investing and is putting a lot of little bets on the table and as opposed to developing category leaders. That's when you look at the data across the years, across the world, across um, those. So you've got to understand that when you're looking at the data that way, you're looking at maybe 400 deals, maybe 600 deals, maybe 300 companies on a, a slice of investment, venture investment over one year globally. So how representative is that sample? I can say that there's a lot of consistency over the last 10 years. I can also say that where we're seeing changes in that happening when you compare deal numbers versus deal location versus deal amount, what we saw is that Silicon Valley started higher and got bigger faster. The rest of the world would be approximately five years behind that. So there's a lot of small investment globally. It might be that the economics of scale mean that when you're going really big, you're doing it of three ways. You're getting a massive acquisition like uh, General Motors acquiring Cruise, or you're doing an IPO or a SPAC IPO. So it's going to be, that's not necessarily a Silicon Valley result once you're there in the public markets. Oh, the robotics is branding, absolutely. And it's, um, most companies to succeed drop the robotics because that's not necessarily what their market is interested in. So when you go to your customer, you don't say, hi, would you like this robot? You say, would you be interested in increasing your throughput by 30% while reducing your headcount by, you know, 20% or by, you know, minimizing your something else or solving this problem? So you absolutely don't focus on how you do it. You focus on what problem you're solving. And we see certain things emerge. For example, robot vacuum cleaners, where the robot has become part of the branding of that category. I don't think that we're going to see robot tractors emerge as the branding for the autonomous tractors that are rolling out because that might just be redundant. It's the next tractors that farmers want. Uh, in the same way that self-driving vehicles are not robots. They are, but they're self-driving vehicles. They're cars. And so each industry is going to develop its terminology differently. And one of my favorite definitions of what is a robot is it's something that doesn't work in a demo. Because really, we're coming at it as roboticists from a profession, building something that is still new. It hasn't become a product. And that transition is the place where Silicon Valley Robotics sits, going from prototypes and prod prototypes. A prototype works once. A product works every single time. And that is where you lose robot as a branding, even though it's the same technology. Yes, um, well, a social robot. Why do we want that robot? And it's very interesting because SoftBank, for example, is using a robot as theater. And it was shown to increase sales, but how much of that is also potentially novelty value? If every store has a pepper, then we're going to start ignoring them pretty soon. Robot spam and robot smog are very real issues. However, we're looking now at edge case restaurants where you have robots augmenting the service of meals, bringing food to the tables. Interestingly, there you see very little social interaction because the server needs to have the social interaction to get the tips. So you've got to look at um, the expectation of interaction within that industry uh, in the way that if we look at self-driving cars, the interaction has to be incredibly subtle rather than a feature 
like it's a feature when you don't notice it rather than having connection and conversation. Not many companies have identified reasons why that conversation is the key feature. One of the companies I really like is Catalia Health that came out of the social robots lab at, um, uh, at MIT, then went to Hong Kong, then to Silicon Valley, and they are successful in deploying a social robot as, and they don't, it might be a robot, but they call what they provide a patient treatment plan or a healthcare management system because that's what is purchased and utilised by the customers. The person who is prescribed the robot, and it's prescribed, is the person who uses and interacts with the robot, and they can call it a robot. But the business model is selling a patient treatment management plan to pharmaceutical providers and health management companies. So, um, yeah. Um. Great. So, yeah, thank you so much for answering all the questions, Andra. Um, so I guess we'll be switching over to the new Google Meet link now um, so we can move on to our breakout sessions. Um, yeah, sorry for the confusion, but um, feel free to go over there. The new room is open.